Namaste. So we are finally done <laughs> with that wonderful but very dense introduction by Shankaracharya to this chapter of Brihadaranyakopanishad. And that gives us a start, but it's really more about what was said in the previous chapter than it reveals about this chapter. <laughs> and the context of this chapter, the big context or the big picture, is how the use of proper logic proper inductive reasoning can lead to realization of Brahman. Now, what is inductive reasoning for those of you who failed philosophy 101? <laughs> In Vedic lore, the primary form of logic is deductive reasoning, avaroha panta. That means the authority of the Vedas is considered the highest source of knowledge. Everything is derived from those sources by deduction, which means accepting the source, the authority, the Vedas, as an assumption, an unquestioned truth. But human beings like inductive reasoning, Inductive reasoning, or arohapanta, is a form of logic that kind of jumps to a conclusion based on inconclusive evidence. In other words, if we take the current situation, the currently observed condition, and extrapolate it into the future, that will give us our conclusion. And human beings love to think like this, and it's almost always wrong, <laughs> because things change. That's the way this world is. You observe things now, they look one way. And you wait a few minutes and look again, it's different. Isn't it? So almost all predictions based on inductive logic fail because they have nothing to confirm them until, you know, it's too late. <laughs> so, for instance, this happens all the time in economics and science. People will make an observation, create a theory, extrapolate or project that theory into the future, and come up with a completely erroneous <laughs> prediction. And so that's called, in science, that's called falsification. In economics, it's business as usual. <laughs> because these economics people are actually under the control of the big financiers. And so they're making predictions that will be good for those financiers, those capitalists' investments. So either way, you know, the scientists are also subject to fiscal uh, initiatives and control. So basically, the way the world is set up now, the incentives for people of so-called knowledge are to come up with predictions that basically favor the rich and powerful. But there is a form of inductive reasoning that is valid. That is, when inductive reasoning comes up with the same conclusions as the Vedas. When the Vedas confirm the results of inductive reasoning, it's considered valid. Only in that case. So, this chapter will be an exercise in inductive reasoning about consciousness and how consciousness is derived from Brahman. So the process of inductive reasoning is there simply to conform to our ways of thinking. That, you know, because human beings like to speculate, which is what inductive reasoning is, 
Let's demonstrate a form of inductive reasoning that actually reaches the same conclusions as the Vedas. And then this will be the overarching theme or context of this entire chapter. So, the first few verses create a ground of inference. A ground of inference is a context that supports the speculative leap of induction made at the end. So the first few verses of the chapter involve the creation of a field of induction that will support the reasoning later in the chapter and then which is confirmed by Vedic revelation. So let's go. Yagnyavalka went to Janaka, emperor of Videha. He thought he would not say anything. Now, Janaka and Yagnyavalkya had once talked on the Agnihotra, and Yagnyavalkya had offered him a boon. He had begged the liberty of asking any questions he liked, and Yagnyavalkya had granted him the boon. So it was the emperor who first asked him, Now, who is Yagnyavalkya? Yagna means sacrifice. Vedic ceremonies, like fire ceremonies and deity worship and like that. Any kind of austerity, even Vedic study and recitation, are considered yagna. So, Valkya means one who has perfected. Yagna Valkya is a person who has perfected the art of sacred sacrifice and gotten the result. And of course, the result is self-realization. So Yagna Valkya is sacrifice personified. He knows everything about Vedic sacrifices. So it's not surprising that Janaka, being a great king, the emperor of Videha, which later became Mithila in India, was going to consult Yagna Valkya on matters of the proper means of sacrifice because an emperor or any controller has a tremendous need to offer the results of his work, the collection of taxes and so on like this, in such a way that they become free from sin. So this is the problem of rulership. How do you rule people? How do you tell people what to do and punish miscreants and raise money through taxes without also collecting a lot of bad karma? And the answer is you perform a lot of sacrifices and you also fund the brahmanas, the priestly intellectual class who officiate at these sacrifices to do more and more research and learn more and more from Vedas about how to perform these sacrifices correctly so that they get the intended result. So it's no surprise then that Janaka would call Yagnyavalkya to uh, consult on the royal sacrifices. But now Yagnyavalkya is going to approach Janaka basically for a donation and <laughs> Because of this vow, Janaka is going to question him on Brahman, consciousness, and self-realization. Shankaracharya's Commentary Yagnyavalkya went to Janaka, emperor of Videha. While going, he thought he would not say anything to the emperor. The object of the visit was to get more wealth and maintain that already possessed. In other words, in the old days, the kings, the righteous kings, the self-realized kings, especially like Janaka, would support the Brahminical class and especially the great sages, the realized Brahmanas like Yagnyavalkya. Because, as I mentioned earlier, 
the sacrifices that they officiated at were necessary for keeping the kingdom and the government free from sin. And the fact that governments nowadays don't support and perform such sacrifices means that the leaders have to take on tremendous amounts of bad karma from their ignorant followers. That's why we see that we have now all over the world what's called cacistocracy. Cacistocracy means rulership of the worst people. Why are they so bad? Why do they lie, cheat, and perform violence even against their own people? And, of course, the answer is they are being subject to so much bad karma, they just can't help themselves. And the reason they're collecting so much bad karma is that they're taxing the people and punishing the people without also performing sacrifice. So they get loaded down with such bad karma that their character just, you know, is, is just horrible, horrible, horrible. And so we have cacistocracy all over the world, tremendous corruption and cheating in government. Yagnyavalkya, although he had resolved not to say anything, explained whatever Janaka asked. Why did he act contrary to his intentions? The answer to this is given by the story here related. Sometime in the past, there had been a talk between Janaka and Yagnyavalkya on the subject of the Agnihotra. On that occasion, Yagnyavalkya, pleased with Janaka's knowledge on the subject, had offered him a boon. Janaka thereupon had begged the liberty of asking any questions he liked, and Yagnyavalkya had granted him the boon. Even though Janaka was a great emperor, very powerful, very wealthy, he relied on the advice of the senior brahmanas to govern his kingdom. Yagnyavalkya is also known as a very important author of Vedic law, second only to Manu, the father of mankind. So Yagnyavalkya is an expert on the administration of the kingdom, and he was also an expert in Vedic sacrifice. So Janaka engaged him as an advisor and would query him on many questions having to do with the administration of the kingdom. But now, more than that, Janaka wants to know... <laughs> Yagnyavalkya's secret. How did he become so wise? Yagnyavalkya was known as a great Brahmana, and Janaka was also self-realized. So why did he start this conversation? Well, one reason is that the king is supposed to lead the subjects not only in mundane affairs, but in the affairs of religion and self-realization. So not only was Janaka sponsoring performance of great sacrifices to which the public would be invited and share in the results, he was also sponsoring education based on the Vedas and Upanishads. And since these people lived in a prior yuga, probably the Treta Yuga, because if this Janaka is the same as the Janaka who is the father of Rama's bride, Sita, then he existed about 2.5 million years ago. And this story comes down to us from those times when things were much different, much better, actually, on this planet. On the strength of that boon, it was the emperor Janaka who first asked him, although Yagnyavalkya was in no mood to explain and was silent, that Janaka had not put his question on the previous occasion was due to the fact that the knowledge of Brahman is contradictory to rituals. Hence, the topic would be out of place and is independent. It is not the effect of anything and serves the highest end of man independently of any auxiliary factors. This is a very important point. Brahman is independent. It is not the, the result of anything. It is not the effect of anything. 
is not even the cause of anything. <laughs> Brahman simply is. It is birthless, deathless, independent, self-supporting, not supported by anything else. And the same is true with knowledge of Brahman. Knowledge of Brahman, once known, can never be forgotten, can never be lost. Because knowledge of Brahman opens up a vast world of transcendental existence, consciousness, and bliss. And so once one has that experience, you can never go back to the ordinary way of consciousness where the jagrat is considered the most important state of consciousness, where the ways of the material world, which of course is based on birth and death, are considered, you know, the reality, the way things really are. So this knowledge is unsupported. It doesn't need any logic, any philosophy, any religion. It doesn't require any special background. Anybody can realize Brahman because everybody already is Brahman. And by realizing Brahman, one comes to understand one's self and, of course, everybody else's self as they really are. They are one. They are Brahman. One time, Ramana Maharshi was asked, how should we treat others? And Ramana's reply was, there are no others. Because if everyone is Brahman, Brahman is not uh, broken up into parts. It's not like every individual being is, you know, a piece of Brahman. <laughs> That's impossible. Brahman is non-dual. Advaita, not two. What to speak of, you know, two zillion. <laughs> but simply that Brahman, the original, pure, unborn, unconditioned awareness is reflected by structures like the mind, the brain, the heart, and so on. So just like the sun or moon is reflected in many, many water pots, it's the same sun and moon, and it looks exactly the same, except maybe a little less bright. But it's just a reflection. So as soon as conditions change, if there are clouds, or if the sun moves to another part of the sky, or if the sun sets or the moon sets, there's no more light. There's no more reflection. And that's what death is. When conditions change, when the body becomes aged and can no longer support this function of reflection of Brahman, the body dies. And so... This is natural in the material world. But in the spiritual world, there is no such thing as death. There is no such thing as many. There is only one. And that one is Brahman. And that is what Janaka wants to realize. So he's questioning Yajnavalkya. Yajnavalkya, what serves as the light for a man? The light of the sun, O emperor, said Yajnavalkya. It is through the light of the sun that he sits, goes out, works, and returns. Just so, Yajnavalkya. Yajnavalkya. Janaka addresses him by name to draw his attention. What serves as the light for a man, which he uses in his everyday life? The question is about the ordinary man, with head, hands, etc., identifying himself with the body and organs. Does he use a light extraneous to his body, which is made up of parts? Or does some light included in this aggregate of parts serve the purpose of a light for him? This is the question. So this whole chapter begins 
with a question about light. What is light? Light is that which reveals reality. Without light, our eyes can't see anything. Light is required. Why? To illuminate the objects. Why? Because the material world is by nature dark. Space is dark. It has no light intrinsic to it, at least in Jagrat consciousness. So a light extraneous to the object is required to illuminate it so that we can get up, go out, do stuff, and return. I mean, this is the typical man's day. He gets up, goes to work, and after he finishes his work, he comes home. Isn't it? But he has to have a source of light. That is why traditionally work is done during the day, because the light is available. It's harder to work at night unless one has artificial light or moonlight or something like that. Because we ourselves do not contain, a, you know, a, we don't have headlights on our forehead, right? <laughs> so we need an extraneous, external source of light to be able to see, to be able to work, to function. Question. What difference does it make if he uses a light extraneous to his body or one forming a part of it? Reply. Listen. If it is decided that he, by his very nature, has to use a light extraneous to his body, then with regard to the effects of a light that is invisible, we shall infer that they are also due to an extraneous light. If, on the other hand, he acts through a light not extraneous to the body, but part and parcel of himself, then, where the effects of a light are visible, although the light itself is invisible, we can infer that the light in question must be an inner one. So this is the question. If human beings, ordinary human beings, require a light, to be able to perform their work, their activities, then the question of whether that light is an internal or external one is pretty much decided. But there is an instance where the light is present and visible, but the light itself, the source of the light, is invisible. For example, in dreams. In dreams, there is a light that illuminates the various objects in the dream world. But in most cases, the light is not visible. The light seems to come from within the objects in the dream. So in the case of Brahman, of course, the source of the light is invisible. But the light is there. We call that light consciousness or awareness. And what we're doing here in this chapter, or what Yagyavalkya, Janaka, and Shankaracharya are doing, is preparing a ground of inference for the discussion of Brahman and also the states of consciousness leading up to Brahman such as dream consciousness and deep sleep consciousness. And there's one more important point here. If, however, there is no restriction as to whether the light which a person uses is within or without himself, then there is no decision on the matter of the light. Thinking this, Janaka asks Yagyavalkya, what is the light for a man? In other words, there's a third logical alternative. Whether the light is internal or external, or if it doesn't matter. You see, they're not using Western, two-valued, binary, digital, 
<laughs> black and white Aristotelian logic. They're using at least a logic system that has three values, true, false, and indeterminate. Now, this is the same logic system used by Einstein to discover his theory of relativity. A three-valued logic system is much more powerful than a two-valued logic system because with a two-valued logic system, you will get many false conclusions. Because in many situations in actual life, in actual experience, the result is indeterminate. Another way to say that is it doesn't matter. Whether the light is internal or external, as long as we have light, we can perform our functions, right? So what does it matter? That's the third possibility. So Janaka is already thinking ahead and Yajna Valkya is anticipating this line of questioning. And so he answers in such a way as to support Janaka's inquiries. And this will lead to further questions along the same line. And similarly, they will prepare the ground of inference for the main question, which is about the light of the self, the light of Brahman, the light that reveals everything. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>